Hello and welcome to this video about the sigma function. This is a function that sums up a list of numbers. It is represented by the large Greek letter sigma and sums up all of the values of a particular function of i starting at the first or bottom value and stepping all the way up to the last value of i written at the top, incrementing i by one each time. This is shown by this equation, the left hand side showing the sum in sigma notation and the right hand side showing this sum in dot notation. So let us evaluate our first example. When this sum is expanded out properly it looks like this i is looped from 2 to 7 in increments of 1 so it looks like the sum of all the numbers in between and including 2 and 7 and evaluating this long sum gives us this answer now to evaluate this sum and expanding this to dot notation we see that we have a value of 5 added onto this sum for every value of i I've subscripted the 5's in this sum to keep track of which 5 corresponded to each value of i. So now I've expanded out this sum of 5's to full expanded notation and I've subscripted each 5 to be labelled with the value of i that it corresponded to. And counting up the number of 5's we see that there are 11 so this expanded expression can be rewritten as 11 times 5. Evaluating this expression gives us this number as the final answer. So we've successfully evaluated this sigma expression. Now to find a more general way of evaluating a sum in sigma notation. We'll use these variables so that we can substitute any number into a simple expression. We can rewrite this sigma expression in dot notation labelling each c by its corresponding value of i which doesn't change the value of c. We can then get this simple expression for the sum since there were b minus a plus 1 c's in the sum. We can use this formula to solve these sorts of expression much more quickly. Now to evaluate this expression which is a bit more complicated. When we expand it out we get this sum of numbers. We don't need to label these numbers because the value of i is already found in the expression itself. We can then evaluate all of the terms of this sum and we can finally evaluate the answer to this expression as a number. Now to evaluate this expression it looks like it probably isn't going to be an integer although it might be one. After fully expanding this expression we get this sum of fractions. Evaluating this expression gives us this fraction which isn't an integer and this is what the answer is as a decimal number. Now to find what expressions are in sigma notation from expressions that aren't. What is this dot notation expression in sigma notation? This is what it is in sigma notation. You can see that all of the values of f are summed together from i is equal to 5 to i is equal to 68. Now what is this dot notation expression in sigma notation? This is what it is. The sum of all the cubes of integers from 6 to 101. It is a very compact way of writing an expression even compared to dot notation. And finally, what is this dot notation expression in sigma notation? It is this, the sum of all powers of 5 from 11 to 35. Now to look at how polynomials are represented in sigma notation. Here is a polynomial in dot notation and we have to convert it into sigma notation. It is helpful to get the ith term in this series of terms. We'll use this ith term to get it into sigma notation. i will vary from 0 to n in this case. Now to get the first derivative of a polynomial in sigma notation. Here it is in dot notation. And like before it is very helpful to get the ith term in this series. 
Notice that we choose I so that the coefficient A would be subscripted with I. This is so that when we insert it into the sigma function, we can vary I from 1 to N, like it varies with the coefficients A. If we would have made A equal to the indice of X, we couldn't have easily have calculated the upper and lower bounds of this sum. Now this is what the integral or antiderivative of this function is in dot notation, and we have to find it in sigma notation. We find the ith term so that the coefficient a is subscripted with i, and so then we can use this ith term to pack up this polynomial into this sigma notation with the same upper and lower bounds as the coefficients have. This is the second derivative of the polynomial that we started with. We'll get the ith term in this series, and we'll pack it up into this sigma notation using the same bounds as a has. We can have two sigma symbols together so that we can sum over two variables, in this case i and j. This is a double summation. They come in useful, especially in matrix algebra and with polynomials. Here is an example of a double sum. We have to get this into dot notation. Summing the first variable j gives us this sum, which we still have to sum with the second variable i. So this is the answer in dot notation the product of two sums. Now to evaluate this double sum. We firstly have to evaluate the first sum, which is six sevens added together. I've subscripted them to show which value of j they corresponded to. This is a formula to calculate this sum that we've worked out earlier. There are six sevens added together, so that's the same as six times seven. So we've calculated the first sum being 42. This sum itself must be added together four times according to the second summation function. And here it is written out as a formula. There are four 42s added together, so we can write this out as four times 42. And so this is the final answer. Now to evaluate this double sum and find a more general formula so that we can plug any numbers into it. Evaluating the first sum gives us this sum of a's being subscripted with the value of i that they correspond to. And so it simplifies to be this. Evaluating the second sum gives us this sum of n numbers, which simplifies to be this. And after arranging these variables properly in alphabetical order, we get this formula. Now for an exercise in getting a sum that's in dot notation into sigma notation. This is the product of two polynomials. How would we express this in sigma notation? We can get the outer sum for the first polynomial into sigma notation. We can then multiply this expression out. It has only one term in the first polynomial, so it is fairly easy to multiply. We can then multiply the different powers of x together in each term. Then we can look for the jth term in this polynomial. This is a big step, so we can use this jth term to get it into the second sigma sum. So now we have the product of two polynomials in sigma notation. Now to write simple computer code to calculate these sums that are in sigma notation. Here's the first example. We'll keep the value of this sum in the variable called sum. It's equal to zero because we're going to add each term to it in a loop so as to get the total. Here's the for loop that we'll use. It's in the form used in C, Java, JavaScript and many other computer languages. The for loop varies in many computer languages, but its structure is the same. The minimum and initial value of the variable i is set at the beginning of the brackets. 
the maximum and final value of i is set in the middle, and the step size of i is set at the end, being set to increment by 1 for each step of the loop. So it mimics the sigma sum operator. And so the last part is the body of the loop, in which we add the value of each term for each cycle inside the for loop. In this case it is just i. Now to write computer code to get the value of this sum. And just like before, we'll set the value of sum to be 0 initially, and set the bounds and incremental value of the for loop. But this time it sums up the value of i squared, which is the same as multiplying i by itself, using the star character, which is the multiplication operation used in nearly every computer language. And here's the final example, how to write a computer program to evaluate this sum in sigma notation. We'll set up the loop to go between the bounds of i and increment i by 1 each time it goes around the loop. And then we'll add 6 each time, which is the body of the sigma sum. So I hope that you have enjoyed this video and have learnt something from it. I've found that people don't use this notation except in proofs, so that people don't get used to using it. I hope that watching this video and other similar videos will help you to get used to it, and build confidence in using it. Please click like and subscribe if you really like this video. Leave all of your tips and ideas in the comments, and thanks for watching.